Hey, my name is David Crozy, and I'm here to share with you some of the most important information. Someone that you know and care about is going to need you to share this with them. Maybe now, maybe 5, 10, 15 years down the road, but they need you to listen and then be able to share it. What's that person dealing with? They're having digestive issues. Uh, they can't tolerate certain foods, or maybe they've been diagnosed with IBS, Crohn's, or celiac. They're having joint and nerve problems, so joint swelling and painful kind of randomly, or they're having nerve symptoms down an arm or a leg or maybe in their face. Or maybe they've been diagnosed with this kind of random symptom-based diagnosis like fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome or even MS. I want you to think as you listen to this about who you need to share this with. And so in case you hadn't guessed it, what I'm talking about here is Lyme disease. And I'm gonna share some truly jaw-dropping information about this problem. I'm gonna share a story about how a corrupt medical association created these guidelines that basically made it so that most medical doctors are not helpful if you or someone you care about develop Lyme disease. Ultimately, I'll share my story about how I ended up doing all this research and learning all this. And just to let you know, I do have a link in the description of this video where you can see the articles and resources that I used to create this presentation. So the current CDC estimate of how many cases, new cases of Lyme disease are found each year is 476,000. That's 70% more cases than new breast cancer diagnoses per year. So this is a massive crisis and not very many people are talking about it. Cases have been found in every state except for Hawaii. And I wanna let you know that this is a growing problem. Let's jump over to the CDC website and you're gonna get to see the trend of Lyme disease over the last essentially 20 years. So this is starting in 2001, and I want you to pay attention to that northeast part of the country, Pennsylvania and New York. And I'm gradually working my way up. We're up to 2010 here. All right, 2014. And there's 2018, their most recent chart here. And you can see that the entire state of Pennsylvania and New York have so many cases and these little dots the CDC says represent less than 10% of the actual cases that they believe are happening. These are the most uh, strictly confirmed cases. And so what's causing all those cases of Lyme disease in Pennsylvania and New York? Well, let's take a look here. So in 2018, this lady over in Pennsylvania went through parks throughout the state of Pennsylvania, dragged these sheets on the ground, collected ticks. You can see the size of these. Some of these ticks are as small as like the period on a piece of paper. And ultimately they dissected these ticks. They found that 56% of the ticks throughout the state of Pennsylvania are currently carrying the Lyme disease causing bacteria. So if you walk through a state park, a, a national forest in Pennsylvania, and two ticks drop on you, one of those is carrying Lyme disease. It's crazy to think about. So then my next question was, well, what's going on in some of the other states? Like, like has anybody checked that? And well, in 2017, in the state of Tennessee, which if you're bad at geography, that's the state down here, Eastern Tennessee, they did a similar type of survey. So they went through a bunch of parks in Eastern Tennessee they found that about 10% of the ticks surveyed throughout that Eastern Tennessee region still carried Lyme disease. But this is what really what was really crazy. They found these two parks in Union County, which is just north of Knoxville. And in the one park, like 48% of the ticks carried Lyme disease. This other park, or I think it was 44%, the other park, 78% of the ticks had Lyme disease. And so there's this hot spot just north of Knoxville, Tennessee. And being a mountain biker, being somebody that loves the outdoors, I had to look, well, look, what's just north of, of Knoxville, Tennessee in Union County? We've got a couple mountain bike trails here. And so it's just crazy to think about, but let's say that one of my friends here travels to Knoxville, rents a bike, heads up to these trails. It's like you're heading into a war zone where there's little Lyme disease causing uh, grenades just falling out of the trees everywhere. It's super freaky. Now, once I saw that, I was like, I wonder what it's like in my state. So I live here in Iowa and you gotta see this, but where is the Lyme disease hotspot? It's in Cedar Rapids in Iowa City, which is exactly where I grew up. We got a bunch of mountain bike trails over there. This freaks me out for my family, 
for my friends that would go over and mountain bike, no one is talking about where these hot spots are. As an interesting highlight of this concept, I talked with my mom who lives over in Cedar Rapids just this morning and she shared with me a story about how the youth group at the church she goes to, they went on a weekend retreat and they came back and this kid, high school age boy, over the next two days got terribly sick. So his body was, was basically paralyzed. And when they, when they checked him out thoroughly, he had the bullseye rash. So they figured out he had Lyme disease, they were able to treat him quickly, and as far as she knows, he's doing well now. Um, but what I'm gonna explain with you is that he was actually probably very lucky that he got that sick that quick. Most people don't figure out they have Lyme disease until it's way more progressed and way deeper into their bodies. Uh, interestingly, she others also said that her corgi, Trixie, also was diagnosed with Lyme disease at some point. So the idea of these hot spots being dangerous to us, it's very real. So here's the big takeaways when it comes to Lyme disease prevalence. First is that states with a low prevalence can still have these hot spots where there's tons of ticks that are carrying Lyme disease. Now the big thing is that the further that you get away from those solid blue states, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and then that entire Northeast, the less likely that a doctor is going to be thinking that you might have, have Lyme disease. They're not going to consider it. They're also not gonna ask, well, when was the last time you traveled to these other states? How much time have you spent in the Northeast? The third thing, guys, is that it only takes one. It's kind of like an sexually transmitted disease. I mean, you only have to do it once, you know, in the wrong situation, and, and you walk away with this thing that you might carry for the rest of your life. Um, so it only takes that one infected tick getting on you, injecting the Lyme disease-causing bacteria, and you can end up with this. You know, I was talking about, about just the idea of how many tick bites I've had in my life, probably thousands in the course of my life with my assistant, Sherry, and she was like, yeah, this one time my boyfriend found a fully engorged tick in my belly button. And I was like, that's the most disgusting thing ever. Uh, second, I was like, what was your boyfriend doing in your belly button? Uh, but I mean, that just highlights, you know, most of us have had a number of tick bites over the course of our life. It's not something to laugh about, but pretty bizarre. Okay, so. Let's talk about how Lyme disease works. So Lyme disease is caused by this bacteria. It's a spiral or a spirochete bacteria, like a corkscrew shape, called Borrelia burgdorferi. And it, it basically is in ticks, and when a tick gets on you, it's gonna start injecting you with an anesthesia-like substance, and that's where they're gonna shoot these little corkscrew bacteria into you. And a lot of the guidance says that it takes like 24 hours, but again, it's like there are exceptions to that. So let's say that the, the tick was feeding on little Fluffy, your dog, and then Fluffy scratched it off, and then it goes and climbs on you, then those Lyme disease causing uh, corkscrews could get into you a lot quicker than that 24 or 36 hour period. So the problem with this corkscrew bacteria is that once it makes it into your body, it can travel all the way. So this picture that you see here, this is from the CDC website. This is one of these corkscrew bacteria in somebody's heart. So it can make it into the deepest cracks and crevices in the body. So the early signs and symptoms of Lyme disease, uh, in three to 30 days after the tick bite, the main thing is gonna be fever, chills, headache, fatigue, muscle and joint aches, and swollen lymph nodes. So basically flu-like symptoms, which would be very hard to, to distinguish from any other summertime or wintertime flu. You'd have a hard time knowing. Now, a lot of people have heard that people get this bullseye rash. Unfortunately, you can't count on it. The CDC website says that the rash shows up about 70 to 80% of the time. My research says it's probably way closer to 25 to 50% of the time. And then when there is a rash, a lot of times it's not this bullseye shape. A lot of times it's actually more of just like, it might look like a spider bite. So you can't count on the rash to tell you that you got Lyme disease. Okay, so if it's not caught right away, then the later signs and symptoms, this says days to months, but it can be years. Um, person starts to end up with severe headaches or neck stiffness. They can have other rashes. They can have facial palsy, so their, their face droops. Arthritis and, and pain and swelling in various joints of the body. Um, heart palpitations and irregular heartbeat, because again, the, the bacteria can make it into your heart. 
And then this is where it gets really freaky. Uh, this, this bacteria can make it into both your nerves and your central, central nervous system or your brain. And that's why Lyme disease can cause so many different symptoms. So Lyme disease is called the great imitator because depending on what nerves it affects, you can end up with actual dementia-like symptoms or like Alzheimer's type symptoms, or you can have shooting pains, numbness, tingling down in the hands and feet. So that's the main things that we're looking for and this is what makes it so hard. So you're probably thinking there, okay, well, if you have any of those symptoms, you're like, well, can we get a test done to see if I have it? And this is where it gets really tricky. Again, this is CDC website. They say pretty clearly, they're like, the tests are not very accurate when it first happens, um, but this CDC guidance does not share with you exactly how bad the testing is for Lyme disease. Here's the facts about testing. In the first three weeks after infection, the test is only estimated to, de to detect Lyme disease 29 to 40% of the time. And so essentially exactly when the treatment would help the most to get rid of those Lyme bacteria before they're deep into your body, the test is not gonna be accurate. And as a, as a result of the test not being very accurate, a lot of doctors don't run the test. Now, if the Lyme bacteria makes it into your actual brain or it makes it into your joints where your joints are actually puffing up, now the testing is accurate. So test is 87% accurate once Lyme spreads to your neurological system or 97% accurate if you've got shoulder or knee like swelling up. And so basically when these things are deep into your body and we've got a major problem, that's when the test might work. Uh, my research said the main test accuracy is about 46%. And like I said already, the CDC estimates that testing is only catching about less than 10% of the cases of Lyme disease per year. Um, but I'm gonna tell you, when I went in to my doctor and I said, I've got this strange group of symptoms, I'll tell you about it later, but I got this strange group of symptoms, can we test me for Lyme disease? They ran the test and my doctor just said, your test came back negative. Didn't say anything about the fact that the test is less than 50% accurate. So you can't count on the testing and you can't count on your doctor to know about the testing. So once we say that, people end up with these terrible symptoms and what do they get diagnosed with instead? Well, eventually as I wanted to learn more about Lyme disease, I jumped into a Facebook group called Lyme Disease Support and Wellness. And if you think that you might have symptoms, jump into that group. And I asked a question uh, just recently in this group, I said, if you actually had a test positive for Lyme disease, so you were one of the few that the test was actually uh, accurate enough to show that you had Lyme disease, what all were you diagnosed before you got your Lyme disease diagnosis? And uh, this survey, I've got them ordered in the most, most common. So fibromyalgia was the top with 24, anxiety, depression, migraines, hypothyroid or Hashimoto's, rheumatoid arthritis and juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, PCOS and interstitial cystitis, um, which are these problems down in the ovary region or bladder inflammation that's chronic, irritable bowel and Crohn's disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, syndrome, connective tissue disease like hyperflexibility or Ehlers-Danlos, celiac disease and food intolerances, POTS, which is this where you stand up, you feel like you're gonna faint, uh, your autonomic or automatic nervous system doesn't work. Uh, lupus, Bell's palsy, peripheral neuropathy, and multiple sclerosis. And so here is a typical response by somebody that was asked. So this person said that they were having problems for 25 years before they got a positive diagnosis. They were diagnosed with migraines, irritable bowel syndrome, ADHD, fibromyalgia, myofascial pain syndrome, costochondritis, which is this swelling and pain in your rib cage, and a host of other complaints. She said, even with this combination, I was never tested until I very suddenly fell extremely ill. I got lucky, my first ELISA was positive and then the blots were CDC positive between two back-to-back -back tests. And so that's the state of affairs is that people get diagnosed with all these other problems, doctors don't know the tests are inaccurate and ultimately people that are dealing with these things, they actually feel lucky if they get a positive diagnosis because it's so hard to get a doctor to take these problems seriously. So what we're gonna talk about next is what caused this tragedy to happen. And uh, this is, is gonna sound like a conspiracy theory, uh, but 
basically this group of, of medical practitioners that are on a board called the Infectious Disease Society of America, they got together and created a guideline about what they believe about Lyme disease and how it should be treated. And these, these, these guidelines were based on this, this wrong hypothesis that Lyme is self-resolving, that if a person is found to have it, they can give them a short round of antibiotics and that Lyme disease is never ongoing. And the problem with these guidelines is that basically insurances use these and said, we're not going to cover any treatments for Lyme disease because the IDSA said that, that Lyme disease isn't an ongoing problem. And then in the end, medical doctors who tried to help people that are putting up with Lyme disease, some of them lost their license to practice. They were actually like, sued by insurance companies for practicing wrong when all they're trying to do is help people get rid of their Lyme disease symptoms. And as I share this, some of you might be thinking, well, yeah, this is just a, a group of conspiracy theories that, theorists that are saying that. <laughs> it's not just me. So the things that this IDSA group did and the conflicts of interest in their board were so egregious. When I say conflicts of interest, that means that people that were on the IDSA board they had significant ties to like the pharmaceutical industry or like the insurance industry where it benefited them to say Lyme disease is not a problem that goes on. But in November of 2006, the Attorney General of Connecticut launched a groundbreaking antitrust investigation into the development of the Lyme disease treatment guidelines. So Attorney General of Connecticut, they're like, this this is wrong. This is, this is uh, antitrust. This is a group of people conspiring to do wrong. And the outcome of that antitrust investigation, they found significant irregularities in the IDSA Lyme guideline development process, including significant conflicts of interest among the guideline pan panel members. And so ultimately they said, you need to reconvene, you need to create new guidelines, but I'm gonna tell you those guidelines, uh, the new ones did not work um, ultimately, they're just, you'd have to read the article and that's linked, but it's just crazy to think about what happened here. So again, the IDSA says Lyme disease is easy to cure with a round of oral antibiotics and they say that it doesn't persist. Well, let's talk about findings that say otherwise. So um, in, I believe it was, let's see here, I, I believe 2018, a study was done on rhesus monkeys where they took these monkeys they injected them with Borrelia burgdorferi, that Lyme disease causing agent, and let it get in their body. And then they treated these monkeys with the standard recommended treatment, which is a 30 day uh, supply of the oral antibiotic doxycycline. Well, at the end of these, they went ahead and checked these monkeys and they were trying to find out, are the, are the Borrelia, are they all killed or are some of them still alive? <laughs> Guess how many of the monkeys still had live Borrelia? 100% of these monkeys still had living Lyme disease causing bacteria. And so again, the IDSA says Lyme disease is easy to cure. Well, in rhesus monkeys it wasn't. Here's another one, Johns Hopkins. Again, these aren't just like crazy groups of conspiracy theorists saying this. Johns Hopkins released a 2015 study where they couldn't even kill these, these Borrelia burgdorferi in test tubes. Um, with just the doxycycline. It took like multiple, multiple antibiotics. And so when they say Borrelia is easy to cure, there's, there's over 700 studies that demonstrate that there's persistence of these bacteria, even with these treatments of antibiotics. And so these guidelines, they still haven't been updated today. The guidelines that you can see on the CDC website still say, if you have Lyme disease, you should just need a 14 to 28 day supply of doxycycline and you should be good to go. And I'm going to tell you, as a result, as a result of this, uh, this action of <clears throat> basically this, this group, most doctors, their attitude is that patients who think that they have Lyme disease are nuts. So I'm going to share a story from close to home. When I really felt like my symptoms lined up, with Lyme disease or a Lyme disease co-infection, I reached out to a friend who's a neurologist in one of those Lyme hotspots. So an area on the map that's solid blue, just to see what his thoughts were and what his experience were with Lyme disease. Here's his response. 
He says, it's unlikely that persistent Lyme CNS disease is an actual phenomenon. Did you have a primary Lyme infection? So there's that question. Did I have an infection? Well, I definitely have had times in my life where I felt like I had the flu. So maybe, maybe not. Then he says, I have seen plenty of patients that have made this diagnosis themselves, not referring to you, and most are absolutely nuts to use medical terminology. So you could understand where the skepticism comes from. And so that is the attitude of most medical doctors out there. Again, a neurologist you would think would be as informed as possible, especially living in one of those Lyme endemic zones, but his attitude still remains that that persistent Lyme is not a thing, even though we have all these 700 articles that say otherwise. And you would think that having access, you might think, okay, well, you know, are we talking about good doctors here? Well, let's talk about a couple famous people that dealt with these types of problems. So Amy Tan, she's the author that wrote The Joy Luck Club, and she developed all these terrible symptoms, dementia-like symptoms. At the time, she was living in California, and she went to her doctor, it says here, she broached the possibility of Lyme disease, but her doctor told me three times he really didn't think I had Lyme, that we didn't have it in California, and that it was rare. Tan reminded him that she and her husband split their time between the West Coast and New York, but the doctor was unmoved, so they left it at that. So again, here's Amy Tan. She's living in California, but she spends every summer back in New York. She tells her doctor that, that she's been spending a ton of time up in one of those areas where there's tons of Lyme disease, and the doctor doesn't listen or even act like that's a possibility. Uh, Chris Christofferson is another one. He was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. He was diagnosed with fibromyalgia. His health was declining for years. He's seeing all the best doctors. Ultimately, his wife had to push super hard for him to get tested for Lyme disease. Once he was treated for Lyme disease, his Alzheimer's resolved where he was able to get back out and start touring again. So I'm telling you, the best doctors in the country are not aware of this problem and you're going to have to uh, basically take your health into your own hands and be assertive to find answers. All right, I got to share one more um, ironic story and that's the story of syphilis. Uh, this just has so many correlations to what's going on with Lyme disease and so syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease and both syphilis and Borrelia are these corkscrew back shaped bacteria, which there's really only a few that have been found. Now, both of these follow a very similar path. So both syphilis and uh, Borrelia usually start with a rash or sore. So a person who gets syphilis gets what's called a chancre, which is this sore spot on their private parts. Again, with Lyme disease, a certain percent of people are gonna, gonna get a bullseye rash or some other rash. Both of these can have a, a latent period where there's no symptoms whatsoever for months or years. And then both syphilis and Lyme disease can ultimately uh, get into the heart and the deepest internal organs of the body and they can cross, cross, cross into the blood brain barriers. Uh, but the difference here is that the medical community 100% acknowledges that ongoing syphilis, chronic syphilis can cause all these problems. And yet, like I just showed you, a lot of doctors in this country act like Lyme disease is something that's easily cured and that it go, just goes away on its own when there's, there's, again, there's 700 studies that say otherwise. And if you're somebody that likes to look at crazy periods of history in the world, look up the Tuskegee syphilis study. I mean, this is a horrific story where they took a group of, of poor individuals, they found out that they had syphilis, and they did not treat it and they wanted to follow them through their entire life to see what happened with syphilis, what happened in the chronic state. And the government, our US government, basically approved this study going on for all these years as these men suffered unneedlessly. It's sickening. And I'm gonna tell you that when I look at that, I look at the people that were in charge of that syphilis study and I think that the people that are in charge of those guidelines at the IDSA I mean, they are very similar. And I think at some point we're gonna find out just how corrupt that organization is. And uh, for a second here, I'd like to just propose, uh, when we find that out, if these guys need to be punished, I've got a very simple solution. Uh, basically, we would just take the, take the people that were on that study guideline, the guidelines uh, panel, 
and we inject them with Borrelia burgdorferi. And then they say that it's going to be a very simple process. It'll resolve on its own, uh, but we give them like six months and then the most that they ever get as far as treatment is the current CDC recommended amount of doxycycline and, and, and that's their punishment. Um, because seriously, I mean, I think that this is, is just unreal. So you gotta learn more about that. All right, so what are your action steps? If you're out there, you think you might have, you might have Lyme disease, or uh, you wanna share this with a friend. Well, the first is prevention. So honestly, you need to be wearing the tick repellent so you can get permethrin uh, treated clothes, and you need to be checking your body, again, for these tiny ticks. Um, next, I'm gonna have an article linked that's called Sorting Out Lyme Disease and the Co-Infections. Co-infections are these other problems that can go along with Lyme disease. They're also passed by, by ticks, and you're gonna to wanna to look at that and see if it looks like you might have some of these symptoms. Now, if you think you, there's any chance that you have Lyme disease, the next thing is that you're going to take a Horowitz Lyme survey. So that's this list of like 100 questions and if you show up as having a lot of these symptoms, there, it's been found and proven that there's a high likelihood that you are actually dealing with Lyme disease. All right, so as far as learning more, if you're a movie person, you like watching documentaries, you're gonna watch the documentary Under Our Skin. Very well done, very scary, but you can get a good idea of the background of Lyme. Uh, the second, Patient Zero Podcast. So my wife and I love podcasts. And this is the main way that I got my wife up to speed on this problem of Lyme disease. Uh, this podcast, I will tell you, is one of the best podcasts that I've ever heard. It's put out by New Hampshire Public Radio, and they just did an amazing job of giving you the full background about how Lyme disease was discovered. I mean, it's this crazy story of this single mom who was in Lyme, Connecticut, and her kids were having all these health problems, swelling joints, she was having health problems, and no one was listening. And then pretty soon she discovered that all of her friends' kids were having the same types of problems, swelling in their joints, pain, migraines, and they were getting the diagno diagnosis primarily of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And this woman, she went on a mission to get the word out of it. So she's an absolute hero, but the whole po Patient Zero podcast is just incredible. You gotta listen to it. And then if you like books, you're ready to read more, the book Chronic by Phillips is amazing. Uh, Dr. Phillips developed Lyme disease and that gave him a passion to share more about Lyme disease with people. So it's a great resource. The other two books are How Can I Get Better by Horowitz and Unlocking Lyme by Rawls. All right, so briefly I said that I would share my story. Um, I would say that I was healthy until about age 18. Then I started developing these year-round allergies. So I took Claritin for a couple years, then it was on to Zyrtec. Eventually I was taking Zyrtec twice a day and a nasal steroid, just so I wouldn't have all this terrible sneezing. At age 30, I went on this purification program where I cut out grains, dairy, and processed foods, and all of my allergies cleared up. And so essentially I figured out pretty shortly after that that gluten was my biggest problem. And I'm gonna tell you, if you jump into like that Facebook group, the Lyme Disease Support and Wellness Facebook group, and you search, use the search bar, you don't have to put a new question, but what nutritional changes helped you the most? You're gonna see that people get the best improvement in their Lyme disease symptoms if they cut out gluten and processed foods and simple sugars. And so if you're out there, you think you have celiac disease, you're having trouble processing foods, that's your biggest clue. All right, so at age 36, I uh, started having these strange digestive issues, um, like, like just it felt like I had an ulcer, quite frankly, and like I injured a joint uh, in a mountain biking accident in my fingers, and it didn't heal as quickly as it should. Age 39, age 39, finally, I started having a symptom that I would say was the, the canary in the coal mine. And that was that I started to feel this numbness and tingling and burning in the bottom of my feet. And that's when I really started to say, okay, I got all these symptoms that don't line up. The main thing that would cause that peripheral neuropathy is uh, basically ongoing diabetes. So I got diabetes ruled out. Then I'm like, I think that it's gotta be something to do with Lyme disease based on how active I am and how much time I spend in the woods. This picture you can see here is my wife and I up in Wisconsin. We were there just just in summer of 2020, um, I got into that Lyme disease support and wellness group and I typed in the symptom in the search bar, pain in the feet, and 
all these articles, everybody said it's Bartonella, which is uh, Lyme disease co-infections. And I'm not gonna go deep into Lyme disease co-infections, but essentially Bartonella can cause some symptoms similar to Lyme disease with the nerve involvement. The other one that I hear about the most is called Babesia. And Babesia would cause night sweats. Uh, they call it air hunger, where you feel like you don't get enough oxygen and just chronic fatigue. And so if you're dealing with those problems, you might wanna look into Babesiosis. And so since then, I've been on a journey to learn more about this and to have my body back to health. All right, so after watching all this, if you're still watching, I need you to take action. So first, on this video, I want you to like or comment or share this. You need to share this with your family or friends, anybody that's dealing with these conditions. And we need to get the word out about this problem because again, it's spreading across the country. Your medical doctors aren't aware of this. Let's talk about other healthcare professionals. I'm a chiropractor. For my fellow chiropractors, physical therapists, medical doctors, you need to share this both with both your patients and with your peers. Again, there is just not high enough awareness about this. And I'll be honest, one of the main reasons that I made this video is because I've got a list of about 10 patients and friends that I think I need to share this information with. Uh, the, the one that I remember the most is this 16 year old girl whose health was just nose diving. And she was going to all these different doctors for fatigue and migraines and, and something wasn't right. And I wasn't able to help her. And as soon as I put this video out, I'm gonna be searching back, trying to figure out her name and how I can get a hold of her because she needs to know. And for any of you out there, again, if there's anyone you think that might benefit from this, share this information with them. So I have just one last piece of food for thought and that's, the story of stomach ulcers in healthcare. And there's just, again, too many valuable takeaways that I, I couldn't resist putting this in here. And so here's the deal with stomach ulcers. For most of time, the medical community said that stomach ulcers were caused by one of two things, stress or poor diet. And that was just standard medical dogma. And so you, if you went to a doctor, and you had a stomach ulcer, they said, well, you need to, to, to do things to be less stressed. You need to meditate and you need to eat differently. Well, in the mid eighties, these researchers in Australia found that most people that had stomach ulcers had this new bacteria they hadn't seen before. And ultimately that bacteria is Helicobacter pylori. Um, they found that it causes 80% of stomach ulcers and 90% of duodenal ulcers. So it's the main by far actual cause of, of stomach ulcers. But it took forever for the medical community to come around to this fact. For years, they just kept doing the same exact recommendation. And in one of the most interesting parts of this story, the one researcher, he actually wanted to prove that H. pylori could cause a stomach ulcer and then that a round of oral antibiotics could help um, he had a biopsy done of some tissue in his stomach to make sure he didn't have the H. pylori. Then he drank this cocktail of H. pylori and sure enough, he developed an ulcer and then he was able to be treated with the antibiotics and get back to normal. Um, but even with this information, the medical community didn't respond. And so here are some of the takeaways from this idea uh, that the medical community took over 15 years to accept that stomach ulcers are not just caused by stress and poor digestion. First off, bacterial infections can be the underlying cause of problems in diagnosis. Again, the medical community knows that ongoing syphilis can cause all kinds of terrible health problems. They accept that H. pylori can cause ulcers, and yet when somebody shows up with fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome, or even something like MS, the medical community does not realize or acknowledge that underlying these terrible symptoms, these terrible diagnosis, there could be an actual infection. Um, the medical community is slow to take new information into account. So I actually mentioned earlier that one of my main symptoms that brought me into a doctor was digestive issues. I felt like I was having ulcers. Guess what the doctor recommended for me? He wanted me to do like eight weeks of omeprazole or like Prilosec. So no discussion of let's figure out what's actually going on in your stomach. Is there an effect infection with H. pylori? And so I actually had to ask the doctor specifically, well, can we find out what's going on in there? Can I have this H. pylori test done? 
the average healthcare consumer does not know to ask that question. So even today, I don't think the medical community recognizes that most ulcers are caused by this H. pylori infection. The final thing, there's a quote that I want you to remember anytime that you go to a doctor. Um, whether you're dealing with these terrible symptoms or not, uh, you might also want to share this with a friend. And that's that if your only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So if your only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And what I'm going to tell you there is that doctors, doctors have a small set of tools that they do most of their work with. And if you get outside of those main tools, they're not as confident. And so they don't look for the problems that require those tools as much. The, the tools that most doctors rely on in general in the world today are symptom relieving medications. Uh, they're not, they're not looking as much for these problem solving solutions and they, they probably don't feel confident to try to get rid of like a Lyme disease infection. And like we said, because of the IDSA guidelines, they're actually incentivized not to pursue a Lyme disease diagnosis. And so that's the state of things is that you, if you show up to your doctor, the thing that they're most comfortable with and do most often is saying, well, what medicine is gonna get rid of these symptoms? And that's where I have to tell you, you need to do research, you need to become an advocate for your own health, and uh, I've given you all these resources to learn more. And so I hope this, this uh, presentation was valuable and you got a lot out of it. Again, here's this list of things that uh, if you're dealing with any of these symptoms, I think that you need to learn more and possibly see some providers that are specialist in working with and dealing with Lyme disease.